principles of faith within the Torah, right? So the greater the artwork and subsequently the faith hidden within it, the greater the danger is lying in wait, but also the greater potential for good. So a perfect example is the Mishkan and the Beit HaMikdash. You know, in building it, there was an emphasis on outer beauty, but only because it was built as a house of Hashem. If, if Hashem was, was not, was not going to reside in the Beit HaMikdash or in the Mishkan, if the Shekhinah would not be there, we wouldn't emphasize the beauty. And therefore, aside from the gold, of course, uh, which was the main material used to build the Beit HaMikdash, was ivory, which, which is Shen Habim. The material, what is unique about ivory? It's a material that is strong on the inside, and it allows a beautiful coat of gold on the outside. So art compositions are indeed expressions of Hashem's divine presence in this world, Olam Azeh. And the artist is the vessel through which Hashem glory, Hashem's glory is apparent. Now in Judaism, art it tells a story and provides the framework for deep connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Like everything in the world, art is another tool given to us by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to make this world more meaningful. So it's with great pleasure that I can introduce Richard Rinberg. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. So Richard Rinberg was born in the UK, made Aliyah with his wife and children, uh, four children in 1996, after retiring from a distinguished business career in England. He is an avid student, researcher, and collector of Judaica and Jewish art. Um, Richard has spent his time traveling, researching, and collecting Judaica and Jewish art, attending lectures, conferences at Hebrew University and Bar Ilan, as well, of course, as giving really amazing presentations on Jewish art. And his presentations will allow you to appreciate the fascination of the artwork and understand them in a deeper manner. So, I'm proud to say hello, na'im e'od, buchim abaim, and I will, give, I will give the Zoom over to you, Richard. Thank you. Uh, I noticed there's a box in the middle of my screen that says, please, please move this window away. Um, I'm not sure why it's there, and I move through the presentation. Now, I'm going to talk about Maritzi Gottlieb for up to 50 minutes. Um, and his Day of Atonement, this picture, which is probably the most widely reproduced picture in Jewish art. I doubt if we can go through the Yamim Noraim, if you look at media, without seeing one of these copies every year at least. Um, but very few people, it seems to me, really understand what the picture is about and what it's doing. And the idea of this presentation is to dig into it. Now, um, Maritzi Gottlieb, the actual painting itself, is in the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. He was born, the artist, in 1856, and he died in 1879, which means he was only alive for 23 years. And he's left us, apart from this masterwork, and a masterpiece, and it is a masterpiece, he's left us almost 300 works, and certainly quite a number, because he was from Galicia and Poland, and we know about World War II, a number have disappeared which is Chabal, and hopefully they're going to come back at some stage. Um, but some never will. They were certainly destroyed. And in this picture, you can see I put the arrows. We're actually seeing Maritzi Gottlieb in the center of the painting, wearing a talit, a colored talit, and also as a little boy with a brocade um, top, and also over here with his father looking at a book. Now, let's talk first about Galicia, where he was born. It's this space between Poland and the Ukraine. And in 1772, when the partition of, first partition of the Poland happened, the area was termed the Kingdom of Galicia. But at the First World War, the World War 
1914-18, uh, Galicia disappeared. Why is it important? Well, there's a kugel, and it depends whether you're a Litvak or a Galiziana, whether you say kugel or kigel. Of such things are uh, people divided. It, it seems this box is still with us, which is really annoying. Um, it comes and goes, and I don't know why. So he was born in Drohobitz. Do you, you know what, Mervyn? I think I'm going to stop sharing for a second and come back into it and see if I can get rid of... Um, let's see if I can get rid of it. Okay, so now we're back. Here is Drohobitz, and you can see there is Lvov, Lemberg, there's Krakow. So Drohobitz is where he's born, and um, today it's in the Lvov region or Lviv region of Western Ukraine. And in 1869, which is when Maritzi Gottlieb was bar mitzvah, the population of Drohobitz was approximately 17,000 people. And of those, a quarter would be Ukrainian, a quarter Polish, Roman Catholic, and about 50% were Jewish. So it's a pretty Jewish um, place. And here's a postcard. I have an old postcard. of Drohobitch, live in Etel on the whole where they can trade with non-Jews. So uh, this is a pharmacy, a drugstore, uh, again in Drohobitch. You can see it's quite a, uh, a built-up place. And there are other famous artists who were born in Drohobitch, including E.M. Lillian, who's termed the first Zionist artist, and Bruno Schultz, who's also an author as well as an artist, who was murdered in the Shoah. And each of these people can be the subject, and I have given talks on Lillian, I'm a collector of his, um, and Schultz as well. If you go to Yad Vashem, you will see um, Bruno Schultz. Now, 10 miles away from Drohobrich is Borislav. And in 1856, the same year that um, Ritzi Gottlieb was born, oil wells were drilled, they found oil, and there was an oil rush. And most of the crude oil from Borislav was actually sent to refineries in Drohobrich, and 10 out of 12 of those refineries were owned by Jews. You can see from these old postcards what the landscape looked like. And here's a wonderful postcard showing a shtetl Jew, if you want, a Borislav Jew, carrying oil in buckets. That's the sort of world that they lived in. You took your oil from the oil well in buckets. And there's this man, Iglesi Lukashevitz, just a little bit of history, the first description um, of a simple uh, language using crude mineral oil was provided by this man, Al-Razi, in ninth century Baghdad, who referred to nafata, like neft, nafta, in, in his book of secrets, Kitab, right? Writings. This distilled clear kerosene from seep oil and invented this, the modern kerosene lamp, which had the brightness of approximately um, 10 candles and his work really made him the father of the oil industry. Now, Gottlieb's family, his father Isaac, a maskil, somebody who was still a traditional religious Jew, but open to the wider culture and information, he owned one of these small refineries in Drohobitch, and he married Fania, who becomes Maritzi's mother, who actually gives birth to 11 children. And Maritzi, born in 1856, was the eldest. He's the Bechor. Four of the sons became artists, one became a lawyer, a daughter was a teacher, and all of them actually went by Polish names, as you can see here, except one called Chaim. And Leopold Gottlieb is actually another famous artist. Uh, he was in the same circle as this man, Markus Jakalewicz Rothkowitz, who's Mark Rothko. So these are, this is a serious family, and they've obviously got something genetic. Here's the choral synagogue in Drohobitch, and a postcard, an old postcard, uh, there are lots of these postcards, greetings from, and this one's greeting from Drohobitch, showing the synagogue there, a very large, beautiful building. And in 1842, the Maskilim started building the synagogue, and it opened in 1865 and became known as the Groyser Shield. It fell into disrepair, but recently somebody, uh, an oligarch, had it restored. And here you can go and visit it today. It looks very, very uh, much different from uh, the, the decay. but it's a marrow in that uh, synagogue. And I'll draw your attention to this circular window. We're gonna see a circular window and you can see the sort of windows, this is before repair, in this synagogue. 
Now, I'm just switching for a little bit to Warsaw to give you some background of what was going on in Poland, because a little bit earlier than this, maybe 20 years earlier, is the springtime of nations when European nations are beginning the birth of those nations. And in uh, Warsaw, there's going to be a march through this royal avenue, um, and it's a demonstration for Poland to become independent of Tsarist Russia. And this happens in 1861. So Maritzi is now five years old, and the Tsar's troops are going to shoot dead five people. And I've reduced this postcard, so it's not too ghoulish, but this is a postcard that actually shows the five fallen participants. And in fact, three of them were non Jewish, two of them were Jewish. Both Jews and non Jews wanted Poland to become independent. And there's this identity, I don't want to say crisis, but within Jews, are they Polish? Are they Jewish? They're Polish Jewish. The answer is yes to both. But they feel very strongly about Poland as their mother country. There is a parish Pauline here, you should live, why Jews have lived in Poland. They lived in Poland for a thousand years. Um, and here we see three coffins, because this is a burial taking place in a non-Jewish cemetery. This is a painting called The Funeral of the Five Fallen in 1861. By Alex. This only shows three people because this is, these are the Christians. Two are Jewish, but two rabbis turn up. They walk there. This was on Shabbat. They walked to the cemetery to take part to show their uh, solidarity with the non-Jews who've been killed. And let me show you, or murdered, shot by the Tsarist troops. Let me show you, these are Chofshev Rabonim. They're not just anybody. Uh, Rav Dov Ber Meisels, this is a, a photo of him. And you can see he was the chief rabbi of Krakow, Krakow, one should say. Krakow is the German uh, way. If you go to Poland today, they much prefer Krakow, not Krakow. He's also the chief rabbi of Warsaw, which is what he was when he uh, attended this and he was also a member of parliament. And the other rabbi is Marcus Jastrow, who was rabbi of the German synagogue in Warsaw. And if ever, those who do Duff Yomi, if ever you look up a word in the Jastrow, this is the Marcus Jastrow who wrote uh, the dictionary for Aramaic uh, to explain some of the terms. Now, Moritz's father being a maskil, he wants his son to have a really good education, his oldest son. And in 1863, so Maritzi is now seven years old, he goes, he's been to Cheda, but now he's going to go to a Polish language Catholic elementary school run by these Basilian fathers, Greek Catholics. And their motto here, you've got it in Latin, bonitatum et disciplinum et scientiam docemi. And it actually comes from Tehillim, tuv tam vat lamdeni teach me goodness, discipline, and knowledge. So he's going to get a good education there from the Basilian Fathers, he's the monastery today. And then he's going to move on to the gymnasium, the Franz Josef I gymnasium in Drohobich. And a gymnasium is going to give you an education that really wants you to go on to a university, to higher education. It's pretty academic. And he's going to draw these sorts of cartoons and do some paintings to the extent that his teacher is really very, very impressed with Maritzi Gottlieb. Um, and he wants him to go on with his painting and drawing. And he tells his parents, so Maritzi is shifted to a different school, actually in Lviv, which is Lvov, which is Lemberg, uh, all the same place, which is, again, a gymnasium. He's going to be taught in German, which is going to become Maritzi's language. It's the oldest high school in this city. And you can see the distance there. Um, when he's 15 years old, he's going to go to Vienna to study at the Academy of Fine Arts. He's only 15. Um, pretty impressive to go all the way to Vienna. But this is his love. He basically writes in his diary, which I, with my daughter, translated, that it, the academic subjects don't really interest him except history, but he loves art. So he goes to this academy. Now, when he's there, a couple of years in, he's studying and learning. This World's Fair takes place in 1873. These World's Fairs take place in a number of countries, had them in Britain, in France, and the one in Vienna, the only host to show theirs off. And here are some photos from that exhibition. Here's the main entrance. You can see the Rotunda building. 
here you can see the extent to which people go the the turks the ottomans build up this whole minaret there are japanese gardens here's the japanese pavilion so this is an eye opener for somebody like Maritzi to see coming from Drohobitz to this, to see, I mean, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you're in Vienna, it's the center of the European world from their point of view. And in fact, although I've played it up as a wonderful thing, it was actually a terrible failure because they had a stock market crash a week before it opened. There was a cholera outbreak in Vienna killing 3,000 people. We shouldn't think we're the only ones with medical problems. Uh, they had their own tourists, shall we say. And they thought 20 million people would come, but only 7 million people turned up. So actually, economically, it was a bit of a disaster. But Maritzi sees these paintings that are an eye-opener to him, especially these historic paintings by Jan Mateko, who is in Poland probably their most famous painting of historical items. These are huge canvases showing these important events in the life of Poland. This one's the Union of Lublin from 1869. Um, here is Maritzi Gottlieb's, sorry, here is uh, Jan Mateko, who's going to become the most important teacher uh, for Maritzi. Here's a photo of him and, and Jan Mateko's self-portrait. And here's another one where Ray and the Fall of Poland, basically they're prepared to give their life, fighting for Poland, go and fight. And there's a whole historical back background to these pain. He goes to Krakow, to the School of Fine Arts, so he goes from Vienna. You'll see he's changing places. He's a quick learner and he absorbs and then he wants to move on. He's a very impatient young man. Um, but he wants to go and learn from Jan Mateko, who's studying in, who's a teacher in Krakow. So he's going to go from Vienna to Krakow and he's going to get enrolled actually into Jan Mateko's class here. And here's Maritz's first painting of note, shall we say. Um, and any time I don't say who painted the painting, it is by Maritzi Gottlieb. And it's him dressed as a Polish nobleman. He does this in 1874. He's born in 1856, so he's 18 when he does this. Now, he's obviously seen a painting like this by Rembrandt, who's also a Polish nobleman, and you can see the similarities between that. So he picks up the ideas, he's very quick, and he puts them into action. Now, let's look at what he's wearing. He could have chosen any hat. Here's a number of Polish hats that I picked. But this is the one he takes because it's the four-cornered Confederate hat that was worn by this Polish national hero. And it's a little bit unpronounceable. But in fact, if you look on American stamps, he went off to the United States and he was a hero in the revolution. And if you go to Washington, D.C., there's a statue to him. He's quite a hero in, in, American, in, in, in the States. And he's also wearing this belt, which is actually uh, a very famous uh, piece of um, uh, clothing that you'd wear. The that's belt, an additional symbol in, in Belarus. And he's also going to wear this fur cape, a fur, fur cape, sorry, as if he's a, uh, a nobleman. And it's basically Maritzi saying to the world, I am a Pole. He knows he's Jewish, he's been to Cheder and he comes from a traditional home, but I'm also a Pole. And he writes in his diaries, he wants to give his life to draw together the Jews and the Poles, because he knows about the anti-Semitism, which he's also going to suffer. Now, I'm not going to talk about the other paintings because there's just too many of them in the time available, but I want to show some of them because he's, he's a wonderful, he's a wonderful artist. artist. You can see this in the um, Tel Aviv Museum of Art. It's a portrait of his sister in 1874. And here he is in Krakow. Here's a, a photo of him I've circled. You can see his face. He's 19 here. But he has a bit of a dispute with one of the teachers, um, not Mateko. And he goes off to Vienna again, to the Meisterschule. And then he has a dispute there. You can see the pattern. And he goes back to Drohobitsch. And then he goes on to Munich, to the Fine Arts Academy. Now, here he is in the Fine Arts Academy in Munich, where there's also the Alta Pinakothek, the art gallery where you can see fantastic paintings such as another Rembrandt, The Sacrifice of Isaac. And he sees this painting, The Self-Portrait in 1629. And here's Maritzi Gottlieb. He's 20 years old now. Now I stress that unfortunately we're going to see he dies when he's 23. It's amazing that he fitted into this short life. And the period of time, because we've lost some, is incredibly short, maybe four or five years maximum. So here he is, 
And he also no doubt saw this. And you can see the chiaroscuro, chiaroscuro the, the shade and the light. And he's playing around. He's trying things on. He's learning all the time, learning techniques. And here's his portrait, self-portrait as a Hazuer. Now you can understand this in a number of ways. A Hazuer can be understood as the wandering Jew, the Jew who wanders throughout eternity, uh, who's condemned uh, because he doesn't help Jesus on the way to the cross. There are many, many paintings, pictures, novels about the wandering Jew. Or you can understand it as a Hazuer, as Achashverosh from the Megillah, that he's the king, he's wearing a, uh, a coronet, if you want. Um, and you can see he likes this three quarters portrait. This is Maritzi, obviously, there. And there's a, a photo of him. He's, he's a good artist. I mean, he's a really fine artist. And if you look really closely, you can see on the coronet, there is a Magen David here, showing he's the Jewish Ahasuer. Now, one of the huge events in his life is he meets this young lady, Laura, who's born in 1857, a year uh, younger than him, and he falls deeply in love with her. Uh, but he's a poor artist and she's from a well-off family in Vienna. She has a number of brothers. She's the only daughter. She's the princess. And they insist, she actually gets engaged to Maritzi, but they insist that she break it off and marry somebody suitable. And she does in fact do that. And she marries this man, Leo. Um, later on, Laura, uh, Laura Henschel is going to end up in Holland and uh, the books will say she's on the last train to Auschwitz and she dies on the train. It certainly is true she died on the train to Auschwitz. She leaves behind a diary and through her family she leaves behind quite a bit of knowledge. There have been some romantic novels about this and she actually mentions in her diary the artist who committed suicide because of me and that was picked up that Maritzi committed suicide. I think most serious art historians today do not believe he committed suicide. Um, now, here's a photograph that was taken of Maritzi in Vienna, uh, at a fancy dress, a costume party, and he painted himself um, in this garb, um, no doubt from the photo. That painting, unfortunately, has been lost, probably in the Shoah, but his brother Marcin, who's born after him, does a copy of that painting uh, before it gets destroyed, and we only have now the copy left, but you get the idea of what Maritzi was doing, again, trying things out, the same way as Rembrandt did. This painting is, the, is, is in the Israel Museum. Um, and again, I don't want to talk too much about it because of the time issue here. This painting, which he does in Munich, uh, is the first that gives him a gold medal, Shylock and Jessica of 1876 uh, from Shakespeare. Uh, Shylock and Jessica, his daughter with the key, he's going out and leaves her in charge. And again, this is a breakthrough painting. Why? Because, and here we actually have a photo of Maritzi Gottlieb with the painting, a color catalog, and we've lost this painting. It's Chaval, but we've lost such things. Whoops, sorry, it seems to have got a mind of its own. But if you look at works done by others, uh, you can see that their approach is that there's the nasty Jewish Shylock, and here's Jessica, this is 1830, Here's one from 1854, and you can see Shylock, you can see all the negativity in this scene, another one, but he does this absolutely beautiful scene, the loving father and the beautiful daughter, and in fact, her face is his beloved, is his, you'll see her again and again in the, the uh, paintings. Um, he can't get uh, her out of his mind. Uh, why Guiana picked up on this, uh, you speak an infinite deal of nothing. Um, interesting. Um, so here we have a copy done by Marchin again of the original. Um, not bad. By the way, if you haven't seen The Merchant of Venice with Al Pacino, the film, it is excellent. And historians will tell you pretty accurate in many ways. It's certainly worth watching. Now, I found this from um, the, the Jewish Chronicle in 1876, a rising artist, a Christian correspondent of the Israelit, that's an orthodox uh, Jewish paper, gives an account of a young artist, Maritzi Gottlieb, a co-religionist, a native of Galicia, who shows extraordinary talent for the art of painting and bids fair to rise to a very high eminence in it. The youthful artist, only 20 years of age, is most enthusiastic for the ancestral religion, Judaism, and he's, he's taken that to heart. 
He works now under Pilati, who's a professor of art at Berlin, having previously studied and given remarkable proofs of his genius in the academies of Vienna, Krakow, and Munich. By the way, I took this uh, little section as Hakol uh, Shemayim because you see here the new West End Synagogue for anybody from London. They're actually buying their site. Why is that important to me? Because my wife and I, and it's actually my, our 35th wedding anniversary today, were married in St. Petersburg Place in that shul. So that's like a personal connection <laughs> to this piece. Now, this is Maritzi again as a 20 year old. It's, I think it's a bit unfinished, but he really wants to do this. He wants to look at the tichel and describe it. And we're gonna have a look at some of the items that Polish Jewish women would wear, such as the tichel, diminutive of two cloth, the headscarf, right? Which is worn for tzniot. And here's a Kaufman painting, Isidore Kaufman, showing a stern tichel, a star form on top of the wig-like kupka, the cap. And it's made of precious stones or pearls. Here's a real one that's from the Israel Museum. And it's worn on Chag or Shabbat by Eastern European women. And if you met a poor bride, you could take off a pearl or a stone and give it to her to help her. And these actually I took in, in St. Petersburg. Um, the brustuch, it's this, it, the plastron, the brustichel, it's a breast cloth. It covers up the buttons or if the, the, if the cloth was to pull apart a little, it's a modesty. Uh, these are probably from the 19th century. Here's a lovely painting again by Isidore Kaufman. And here you see Maritzi Gottlieb's painting, 1876-77, with another Jewish lady with a Sterntichel, or wearing a kupka, a Shabbat cap. And this is a real kupka, and it's showing Spanier Arbeit, which is a particular Jewish technique, um, using, instead of um, thread, it's metallic thread, and the term itself, Spanier Arbeit, either comes from spun work from the Yiddish spinnen or Spanish work produced in Spain. And this I took in St. Petersburg as well in the New Jewish Museum there. And it shows the atara on a talit. And this is the sort of work, or they would do it on kippot. And again, that's a whole, and this is the machine that you do, that you'd use to produce it. There are very few people in the world who still know how to do this. It was sort of one of these secret things that, that people kept to themselves so they could make money. Um, and here we have a painting Maritzi did, 1877, Uriel La Costa, where he's, I think, painting himself and his beloved uh, Judith Van Stratton in the novel by Guskov. But uh, this is Amsterdam, and I'm not going to go into this story again because of the timing. Now, here's a portrait of Laura, uh, his fiancée, uh, that is in the uh, Tel Aviv Museum of Art, along with the uh, painting I'm going to get to in a, just a sec. Again, beautiful painting, beautiful young lady, really good technique. And here's an unusual self-portrait that actually is next to the one of Laura straight in some ways, um, but very psychological, very penetrating. Now we've got to the painting itself, and you can see it's huge, eight feet high almost, six feet wide. I mean, this is huge. And when we look at the painting, you count the people, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there's nine people. You haven't even got a minyan, unless you can count yourself as being the observer. And he's looking at you, Maritzi. This is him in the center. And then in the top, you can count another 11, but in fact, it's hard to see. There are a couple of people pointing through. Now, again, what he's actually doing, and I can read you if I have the time from his diary, he's painting himself, his family, uh, his beloved, who's in there twice, Laura, Laura talking to her mother. So this is actually, as it were, him dreaming um, and using bits. This isn't actually in the shul in Drohobich. Uh, again, one could talk for an hour on, on the architectural detail that you can see and where he got it from, but he's getting inspired. And I want to show, I actually had to go to the museum and take some really close up, I spoke with the curator, some close up photos so we can actually see what's going on. You will not be able to see this from reproductions, you just can't get the in close enough. How do we know it's Yom Kippur? Machzor shel Yom Kippur. So it's actually written on the book there if you can get in close enough, right? So we know it is Yom Kippur. But when in Yom Kippur? Well, there's a shofar down here. So we're probably not talking 
Coleridge, right? We're talking late in the eight and there's a book there. Now, the book the boy is resting and the young Maurizio, and we'll see why he is the young Maurizio, is resting his arm on. If I flip it upside down, you can just see Melech. And again, I've taken the Wurms Machse from the 13th century, and you can see it's, he's, he's pretty accurate in how he's dealing with everything. It's remarkable. Now, how do we know that this is the young Maurizzi? Because they're both wearing identical pendants. And if you, again, you look in really close, you'll see a mem and a gimel on those pendants. Moshe, Maurizzi, Gottlieb, right? Now look at the Sefer Torah. This is remarkable because I've written out the lettering. And again, uh, you can see Kete Torah, the Davan, the Zichron Nishmat, Hamanoach, right? And then Rabbeinu, uh, Moreha Rabbeinu Gottlieb, Moshe Gottlieb, Rev Moshe Gottlieb, and then he gives the dates. That can be 1878, actually can also be 1879. I know the Chet is an eight, and according to how the Jews count, and this is the English, donated in memory of our teacher, the late Moshe Gottlieb. He is at this stage, 22, and he's writing on the Sefer Torah an inscription, as it were, predicting his own death. In fact, when his father sees this, um, he insists that he rubs it out. And Moshe Gottlieb, Moses, uh, Maritzi Gottlieb does rub it out, but then later on he puts it back. And it's quite amazing. Now, clearly, why did he do this? He doesn't paint for posterity in the future, but to actually put a date, and then that date becomes correct, and that's the basic reason why people believe he committed suicide. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, so I want to look at this because this to me was very, very interesting. Um, and I'm gonna have to just move this so I get away. There's inscription on the wall here. Now the first inscription, and you'll see this in all the various books, says, and you can read it here, Kuma Hashem Yofutso Evecho Vyanusu, Right, Masanech Nipanech is not there, but we know it all from when you take the Sefer Torah out. Rise up, Lord, may your enemies be scattered. Right, so that's the sort of pasuk from Shul that you'd put in, and everybody knows that. What was fascinating to me is, and I really did look at everything you possibly could look at, is nobody talked about the second inscription. So I wanted to know what it said, and from the reproductions, you, you, you really couldn't see. So I went to the museum, and I made sure to photograph this as close as I could. Uh, you can't get as close as you'd like because the guards there get very upset. But I managed, uh, and I'm sure about this now, and it's been accepted by the, uh, the academics in the field who, who I've shown this to, who uh, are professionals. I'm very much an amateur. Um, Baruch Hashem, Asher, and there's a nun there. So that in English is, blessed be the Lord that. And I would have bet, as I would think most people who would go to the Beck asset, the range of words would produce any number of possibilities as to how you would carry it on. Now, there are actually 22,000 odd verses in Tanakh. So my question was, how many begin with that? And before I did this, I expected, I don't know, 100, something like that. Uh, anything up to 100, over 100, it really wouldn't have, Right? Amazingly, if you go into Google, and this is the power of search engines, or go into any search engine, you'll find there's only one pasuk that this fits. Just one from Malachim Aleph. And here it is. Baruch Hashem Asher. And then Natan Menucha La Mo Yisrael. Right? And let me put it down here. Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he's promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promises, right? Lo no fal davar echad mikol davar ahatov asher diber b'yad Moshe avdo. B'yad Moshe avdo. Most Moshe Gottlieb, Maritzi Gottlieb. He picked this pasuk. He certainly picked this pasuk. He saw himself. He's obviously having a fight. Am I Polish? Am I Jewish? And he's had the upbringing he's had. But... Um, I can actually prove that he picked this, and now uh, I've changed the color and washed it out, except you can see Moshe Abdo, Abdo, and 1856. The one thing everybody knows about themselves is the year they were born. 
you don't know anything else. And strongly, I would suggest that when he was painting this, he, he took a Tanakh, he opened it at that which corresponded to his year of birth, and he put in that, he put into this painting this clue waiting for someone to find it. I must tell you, I have not seen in any academic paper or heard anyone tell me that they have commented on this, noticed this or whatever. Uh, I've written a paper which, uh, but for Corona, I believe would have been published this year. I'm still in hope. Hopefully it's gonna be published, but I believe that it's there. And I, I, I think in a court of law, I would be able to sway a jury to, to my belief. Now, this painting is iconic. Um, for everything that it represents, the story behind it, the love between this man and the young lady, the possible suicide, which makes it very romantic. Um, it's picked up Mozambique, for goodness sake, although they show a Marcin copy, not, not Maritz's own. This is a portrait of his sister. Um, here is his picture of a, uh, a Sofer. And again, he's trying out different techniques. Here is a picture, again, the Jewish Jesus. You can see the Talit here, and here's Maritzi. And again, one could say so much about these pictures. I'm just showing how he puts, he gets this from Mateko, these great historical pictures. So, um, and this is where the Jewish Jesus is preaching at Kfar Nachum, Kapanem, in 1879, a painting. There are many, many paintings by him. They are all, I think, just gorgeous. A uh, Japanese lady, if you remember in the exhibition in Vienna, this is in a private collection, uh, he saw this Japanese room. I mean, for a fellow in the 19th century who's born in, in Drohobich, agreed he's been to Vienna and such like, to start painting as widely as this is really remarkable. Um, here's a photograph of him uh, in 1879. And now what happened was that in Krakow, he actually uh, caught an infection which I believe is something like a strep throat, which really became badly infected. And with the medicine at the time, he went into hospital, but they didn't have antibiotics. You've got to be, uh, what, 1928, something like that for antibiotics, early 20th century. Uh, so they didn't have antibiotics. They tried to operate, but unfortunately he died. Now, if you want to tie it to Laura, you could say, well, he neglected himself. Uh, he was so much in love and she had broken off the engagement and he would go out for long walks in the rain. He was so upset um, and he caught a cold and therefore he didn't look after himself. Of course, um, by then he'd actually met somebody else who, who I think he really loved. So um, I'm not sure that the romantic story is the true one, but he was buried. Mateko came to his funeral. Unfortunately for him, it was a terrible, terrible uh, uh, day in terms of the weather. And uh, he was buried pretty quickly and everyone went home. And it was only much later. Amazing, we, we really should erect something. Whoops, sorry, I don't know why it's done that. We should erect something over his grave and this is put up. And here you can see the map, you can go and see it today in the New Jewish Cemetery. Uh, when the Nazis came into Krakow, a lot of this stuff was smashed up, but they put this together. Um, now, if you go to the Jewish Chronicle in 1879, there's this huge obituary uh, written about him. And I'll read a little bit about it. David Kaufman, who writes it, is a famous Jewish Austrian scholar. Um, he's actually the first one to use the term Jewish art. Um, he's regarded as the founder of Jewish art history. And this is what he writes. And I'm just reading the first paragraph. On the 18th of June, that's 1879, there was buried in the Jewish cemetery in the old town of Krakow, a young man whose death may be regarded as a great loss to the Jewish nation. A branch has been broken, which the tree of Israel sometimes produces apparently with the object of showing its enemies and detractors how wrong an opinion they have of the Jews. The false statement, which our enemies, even in olden times, made with regard to the Jews, was that they have no taste for art, being too much, too much matter of fact to occupy themselves with the noble and heavenly art of painting. A mother in the little town of Drohobich may be proud of having given birth to our hero, whose life, though alas, very short, was sufficiently long to prove a powerful reputation, refutation, sorry, of the ridiculous calumny. And just one more paragraph. Uh, how could a 
genius have arisen out of his art. Sorry, I have to remove this. Only to be torn down, though, when he'd nearly reached the summit of his profession. Had not God blessed him with his holy goodness and strengthened him in his love for his nationality and religion? This is real 19th century writing. Thus may we regard the never dying power of our people. And this thought will be a consolation when we look at the grave in Krakow. In an out of the way corner of Galicia, there was born a man who was an honor to our nation and a bright star in the artistic world. He was one of whom we may be proud and whom we can point out to our enemies as a proof that the Jewish nation can and does produce true artists. Now there are gonna be a few exhibitions about him. I have this catalog from uh, Warsaw 1938 before the war. What's fascinating is there are a number of pictures at the back of this catalog that don't exist today and I've not seen in, in, in um, uh, some of the books on him. There's this uh, exhibition that took place in Jerusalem at the Bezalel National Museum. The Bezalel School of Art has its own museum which is going to turn into the Israel Museum and this is 1956, 100 years after his birth in 1856. And then more recently, 1991, and this is the best catalog if you want to look at his work in terms of the essays and the catalog in English from the Israel Museum um, from the 1991 exhibition. And very quickly, I'll, I'll deal with this. I've got a few minutes. Um, if you went to Betat Futsot uh, in the 1970s, they had an exhibition on the days of awe. Is a picture um, that shows on it, the days of awe, you could read it in there if I was to blow it up. And they have the Worms Machser, it's all facsimiles. And they paid a company in England to produce a replica of this painting. And this is the replica they did. And it was basically glass that's etched. And this was up there for quite a while um, until a lawyer came over from, a lady lawyer from the United States, from New York, and actually threw a fit when she saw this. And I don't know if it immediately hits you in the face, but clearly, all the women have been removed and only the men are there. So she asks around in the museum uh, in Betat Futsot, what's going on? I, I know this painting, I've seen it, it's in the Israel, uh, sorry, the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. Why, why have you got this reproduction, but you've altered it? Can you do that? Can you take a great work of art and fiddle around with it and do what you want? Why have you removed all the women? And somebody gives her the answer at, at a later stage, um, well, we, we wanted this exhibit to be to do with kavana, to do with concentrating and tefillah and such like. So we wanted to emphasize uh, the kavana aspect, so we removed all the women. I.e., women don't have kavana, only religious men do. And so we wiped them out, we've replaced them with a chandelier. And in fact, there is a very nice article called Finding a Void in a Heritage uh, women are erased in a Tel Aviv reproduction of a symbol of Yom Kippur. This becomes a real cause celebre. It actually, there's court case at Tel Aviv University and uh, the vice principal was the director of Betat Futsot. And when I raised the issue of this, he became incredibly defensive. This is a very, very sensitive issue, even today of Betat Futsot, that they did this. And in fact, they, they say they put it in storage. I, I wonder whether it's actually behind this wooden panel that's screwed over it. I would love to go down there with the screwdriver and undo it, but, but I wouldn't do that. Um, they've actually refurbished uh, and redone better foot socks, so it probably is now in storage. But at the time I took this picture, I think it was still in situ, but it became such a cause celebre they had to remove it. Now, there's also been an exhibition, a really good exhibition in Lodge, uh, and I actually flew there for this exhibition uh, to speak to the, to the lady who put it together. And here she is. She's actually one in the archives who found this uh, photo uh, and, and brought it out. No one had, had seen this in a hundred years. And here is the real painting which did travel from Tel Aviv to Lodge. It doesn't travel too much. Uh, you're not allowed to photograph inside. So it's the only way I could get a photograph of the painting, asked to take a, a picture in front of it. Um, now I want to show you something in the remaining minutes which is quite remarkable and to show you what a fixation people can have on this painting and here's Toby Cohen um, and he's a paparazzo, he's a, a London boy, he's, he was a photographer or is a photographer, an artist and he did a photographic recreation of this painting um, and here 
me is is about sharing second and i'm going to show you a literally a three minute film and you're going to see how he put this together and he really did a very very good job uh in doing this so i'm going to stop sharing now and i'm going to now share my screen and hope that i can show you and this should work um to show you this My name is Toby Cohen. I'm the artist, and this is my self-portrait. We went to the theatre in Pennsylvania, filmed the stage, painted it in order to match the background of the painting. This is David, my muse. He's fiercely critical about every decision I make. This is my father holding a model of the state of Torah with a plaque inscribed in memory of my late grandmother. He's anxious for me to be a commercial success. Seeing God leaving the painting really made it come alive. After choosing the painting, I wasn't sure that um, I'd be playing the role of the artist, but after hours of discussion, I decided that to remain most faithful to the painting, it would be important that I play the role of the artist himself in the painting. For about 30 years I had to put up with all your nonsense and this is really the top of the top of the top of it. I felt it was important to bring the people that I love to see in it. I was so happy that my mother and father came. My father wanted so much for me to be a commercial success. My mother desperately wants me to return to England. We really completed the picture when we were in England. Making artistic decisions on the day of the shoot is incredibly stressful. For all intents and purposes, the more I learn about photography and the more I progress in terms of building and directing a set, actually pressing the button has less and less to do with the, uh, the image. I wanted to remain most faithful to the painting. There are so many small details in the painting when you see it in real life, never imagined existed. the characters, how am I related to them, what stories are they going on with in it. The final picture allows you to really be there with Gotti and the people of his family on the day of his family. My imagination of the painting would have been like So that basically, I think, concludes what I have to say. I thank you for uh, listening and watching, and I hope you found it uh, of interest. And I hope that now when you see the picture, uh, you can not only understand it yourself, but explain it to others. Thank you very much, Mervyn. I'll pass it back to you or whoever's going to take over. Um. At this at this moment, Avram Sampson is supposed to move a vote of thanks, but I don't see him in the list. Uh, Avram, if you are there, please unmute yourself. No, nope, it seems not. Uh, so I don't. I'm not sure it should fall to me to do this. But I found it very fascinating and. 
and very interesting to learn something about a, a, a painting that I, well, I, I probably have seen it once, but uh, certainly have seen many pictures of it. And uh, it, it, it really brings something to life, really, to, to hear uh, more about it and to have someone explain uh, the detail of it. Um, if Rabbi Ott is there, maybe he could uh, unmute and uh, say something. Just, um, Irene, yes. Yeah. On behalf of the committee, uh, I just want to tell Richard that this was excellent. It was a wonderful presentation, and I know we will talk about it. And I thank you very much for your um, for your uh, allowing. To, to, to have this go on. I know you've done a lot of programs and I personally look forward to every single one of them. And thank you again on behalf of everybody in our show. Yes, I think you. we're ready to leave now. Yes. And, and uh, I might just add Mazal Tov, Richard. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay, we should leave. So I think that that concludes the presentation yeah. for tonight. And I Why don't you just cl uh, close the Zoom? I think we can close the Zoom now. Yeah, okay. Thank you all for your attendance, if that's the right word. And thank you, Richard.